everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the great honor and pleasure of having a group conversation. On one hand, I've got Kenny Davis, musician, educator, the bass player. On the other hand, I've got Ken Datmore, and he is the strings marketing manager for Yamaha. And yes. so we will be talking in depth about the SLB 300, but as always, I like to like you guys, our audience, to know the people we're talking to. I'll start with you, Kenny. Tell us a little bit how you got your start in music and on bass. I got my start in music in the 70s. There were a lot of garage bands. So I used to always go by there and say, wow, look at these bands. And I got inspired from that. So I started, actually, I was a guitar player first. And then there weren't enough bass players in the neighborhood. <laughs> so they said, oh, let's just play bass. I'm like, okay. So how can I learn how to play this instrument, which was the electric bass? Mm -hmm. They said, hey, man, just go check out Verdine White. So I went out and got Verdine White, Earth, Wind & Fire, and, and, and from there. When I got to college, I, I finally got to check out the acoustic bass. I was playing in the jazz band. They said, well, why don't you play the acoustic bass? I'm like, ah, okay, I did it. I went to the dean of the music school and said, look, you all are jeopardizing my education. You all don't have a bass teacher here. I, I need to get a bass teacher because they had me studying with a, a, a violin player. Oh. So the, the, the dean said, look, go out and get a teacher, young man, uh, we, and, and we, we, we'll pay for it. I, I said, okay. I went to the Chicago Symphony yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and got Warren Benfield. And when I came back and told the dean I got Warren Benfield of the Chicago Symphony, he almost choked. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, I started playing. I'm playing classical, and I'm playing, you know, he's, he's preparing me for the Chicago Symphony. And I got invited to play with the Civic Orchestra, which I couldn't do. And then, lo and behold, I started playing with this band called OTBs, the jazz band that was on Blue Note Records. We were the young guys, and I got a chance to study with Ron Carter. Now, you mentioned that about Ron Carter earlier, about how this guy tried to mimic all the stuff and see this touch. And studying with Ron, one of the things that he taught me was, look, Kenny, because my notes were too short. And he said, Kenny, if you want a longer career, you got to elongate the notes. You, you have a much fast career and playing with more opportunities. I mm -hmm. said, okay. So I, um, you know, he showed me how to brush the strings. Some guys pull the strings, so he showed, how, he showed me how to brush the strings. Lo and behold, before that, then he said, Kenny, can you play this piece of music, Ron? He said, Kenny, can you play this piece of music for me? Uh, noted music. And I said, I played it. I said, oh, he put something harder. Can you play this for me? I said, okay, I played it. I said, he said, okay, I'll see you next week. I said, okay. So he called me a couple of days later, said, hey man, you want to make some money? <laughs> I said, yeah. And then he said, look, I want you to do a jingle for me. So he started, I'm, next thing you know, within the next week, I'm doing Kentucky Fried Chicken, I'm doing McDonald's, I'm doing all these jingles. And the, and the funny thing about my first jingle that I did, they, I came in with my bass and there was a group meeting. And I'm telling what they meeting about. So finally they came over there, anybody who, anybody that Ron sent, we know he's, he's going to be some type of quality. Yeah. So they were having a group meeting about me, mm -hmm. you know. So Ron would say, hey, man, just go in there and play the part. Don't try to be too fancy. So I just went in there and laid it down. So it's about laying it down. Lo and behold, next thing you know, I'm getting calls from, you know, I'm playing with Bono, and I'm playing with uh, Elton John, and I'm playing with uh, uh, Herbie Hancock, and I'm playing with Art Farmer, and, and blah, 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 blah. I'm on a Tonight Show, and I'm doing all this stuff. And then I'm back here, and through all those experiences, I get a chance to play this new silent bass, SLB 300, which is an incredible instrument. So... That's it. And as a matter of fact, I just played it on a Will Downey's record, so it should be out. Very cool. Well, and as much as I know that our audience is chomping at the bit to hear more about the SLB, I do want to give Ken an opportunity to talk a little bit about your background. <laughs> Tell us about you. My background is a little bit more humble. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually don't play a string instrument. My instrument of trade was uh, was tuba and, uh, tuba and trombone. So I'm, a, I'm a little brass player. And I grew up in New York, and I always tell a joke that I was I was walking down the street, and I bumped into an old gypsy woman, and and she fell over, and when she stood up, she muttered some words I didn't understand, and since then I've been forced to travel the world selling string instruments. <laughs> <laughs> but, but literally, literally how I did it, I, I I fell into it after college. In college, I studied music, of course, and and business. And when I graduated, was fortunate enough to get a job 
in New York, the company that owned an old name in the in the uh, string business, William Lewis and Son, and I, I managed William Lewis and Son, worked my way up. Then at one point, I started my own business. I, Im- I imported string instruments and and wholesaled them. And 15 years ago, I had the opportunity to come to Yamaha because they were they were trying to build their string business. They had this quote unquote silent violin. Mm on it and my the joke i always tell it about that is that is that it was developed as a practice instrument so that you didn't need to bother anybody like in japan where everybody lives 15 feet away from their neighbor Mm -hmm. and you can practice without disturbing them so they sent it to the united states and said here it is we're we're having a lot of success with it it's a silent violin and then americans being americans said, cool, silent violin, let's plug it in and see how loud we can make it. <laughs> and it, 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 it initially was not designed for, for that, but the demand was such that it went through it, it went through several generations and then it branched out into a viola, a cello, several cellos now, uh, several different violin models, and the bass. And the bass is is where it really, really became a professional instrument that it wasn't necessarily accepted by uh, by the violin playing community at first. Mm-hmm. And the, the idea of an electric instrument, but basis being of different thinking. You know, there's a, it, there's, you know, you basis could basis come from two worlds. They either come from the acoustic side or they come from the electric side, mm-hmm. and at some point they converge. And the silent bass fit right into the middle of that. It's, it's that you could give the acoustic bass an electric instrument, or you could give the electric player an acoustic instrument, feeling instrument. So it's gone through several generations, and that leads us up to SLB 300 today. I can attest to the virtues of a silent violin because as a child, I found my grandfather's fiddle. And I started trying to play it, and I'm not sure exactly where it disappeared to, but I do know it was never seen again after that. <laughs> so if it would have been a silent violin, I might have had a chance. But part of what we were talking about before we started recording, I, what I'd mentioned in um, the reference to Ron Carter is I'm always really excited when we're talking about bass because it's a relatively new instrument. And as compared to the classic string, you know, the violins, the cellos, the, all, of, all of these, and the constant efforts to try to optimize the sound from those classic instruments. Initially, we were talking about, I'd read a book by Chuck Traeger, who spent a whole lifetime working at giving Ron as much sound as he could out of that upright bass and it was kind of it, it kind of made me think of what the new movie Ford and Ferrari it was how many, how do I get more horsepower out of this one this thing that already is but what little tweak can I do whether it's using a, a, a maple peg whether it's tweaking something uh, a millimeter and then once you've got that instrument tuned in you still have the issue of miking it and we get into a whole other pool of how am I going to do this? I'm going to attach piezos. Do I situate external microphones 45 degrees, three feet away from each other? But then if you move, you're out of the focal spot. Um, you know, it, it's, it has all of these. And the silent bass, the electric basses, solve that to a great extent. But again, it, it, it kind of, you'll have individuals like Kenny that can double up and play both the, the, the electric and upright. And then you've got individuals that will stay just with one or the other. And and so it, a lot of the ones that stick with just plain electric, I think it's because they don't feel that they can get what they're looking for out of their uprights. And I think the SLB and a lot of the electric upright instruments bridge that gap, as you've, as you've mentioned. Now, that said, I'd like to know a little more about from the, the player aspect, because you mentioned this instrument. The features, yeah. what are the features that attracted you to use the, the SLB? Well, the, the main feature that attracted me were the, the uh, three microphone sounds. Okay. Like, uh, there's three high-end microphones that they went in and sampled the high-end you know, mic from the studio. And the first flash would be, if it only flashes one time, that means you get a rich sound. And that rich sound is from like a vintage 
a vacuum mic tube mic. And the second one, when it blinks, if it blinks twice, it has a simple sound. And that mic is from from high end, from like a, a di dynamic microphone. And then the third, if it blinks three times, there's a warm sound that has more bottom. This has a lower end vacuum high end microphone. So now that's that's when you take the button, you turn it all the way to the right. That's only the mic sound. Now, if you turn that same button all the way to the left, now you're going to get a DI sound. And then, so it depends on the room, you can you can mix it in, the DI and the, and the mic. So automatically, so once you come in, you have those options of mic and, and DI sound. Now, one thing about studying with Ron Carter, he always taught me, he said, man, when you go into the, when you go into the room, you look at the room, if the ceilings are high, that means you got to add more trouble. You know, you got to add this. If the ceilings are low, you got to add more bottom. You know, mm -hmm. so he said, and if the rooms, if the room is this amount of time as far as length, so you got to add this. If, 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 it's, if the club is shorter, you got to do this. So he really zero in on me as far as checking out the room and what to zero in on. Now with the silent bass, I got a, I had a chance to use it before the pandemic. And soon I walked into the club, I still do the same thing. Ah, oh, what's the same? Oh. So I just turned the knob a couple of times, and it and it, it was it was sounding great, you know. Got you. And speaking of sound, did you want to give us a little sample of of what? Because I we can't help but see that SLB behind you. Okay, I'm gonna play the exact same thing, and I'm gonna play the three different mic sounds, so you can check here. And I won't play too many notes. Okay, so this is the just blink one. So this is the silent bass with the rich sound. Push button. I bl it just blinked twice. Play the same thing. So now you're gonna get a chance to hear what it sounds like with the uh, second mic. Now here is the third mic sound, which is the richer, warm mic sound. It has a little bit more bottom. sound like if I'm, if I'm walking the bass, say if I want to play uh, a blues, I'm just going to walk a chorus. And if I want to, if I have like a Ray Brown type of sound, watch this. Sweet. <laughs> oh, and, and bow. I was going to ask, you can bow. Yes, yes. So I'm going to play something, something like a D harmonic minor. I've only had the opportunity to hear this instrument played over the din of the NAM show. So it's, it's, it's nice to hear it. I, I'm sure Skype doesn't do it the absolute justice. You got to hear it in the room to get the maximum effect from it. But it's certainly a lot better than having, you know, 20 drum kits going at the same time <laughs> in, 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 in the background. And, and so, Ken, with the features of this instrument, kind of the specs, what can you tell us about this? It uses a technology that's, uh, that's proprietary to Yamaha called SRT, and it, that's been built into guitars and pianos. And e even I thought when it was first explained to me, I said, well, this is some kind of sampling. And it's, and it's really not sampling. It, it uses the analog sound of the bass and it takes that sound and then it tells you what you want it to think it sounds like. And I think that maybe one of the ways to explain it is, remember, remember when you were a kid, you did those paint by number kits 
And it's like, yeah, everybody's grandmother had one hanging on the wall. Well, what it does is you, you have this board and and it gives you colors one, three, five, and seven. That's coming from the instrument. But then the technology inside the bass gives you two, four, six, and eight. And that two, four, six, and eight that it gives you determines what the output sounds like. So the predecessor to this is the SLB 200. So if Kenny took that bass and turned the SRT off, it would sound just like the 200 okay. on it. So when you engage the technology into it, then you have a choice of three different microphones in front of you. And you don't have to mess around with setup time or putting it in the right position. Or in most cases, at, at some point, the player's going to hit the mic with his bow or something like that. It's just, mm-hmm. it's just going to happen. Kenny takes the instrument out of the case, puts it together, plugs it in, and he's got three microphones right in front of him. He can do all the rest right from the instrument. Got you. And I'm glad you mentioned taking it out of the case because portability has been one of the big issues with your standard upright instrument. And that is that that's why they call it the doghouse, because (laughs) it's so big, you got to lug it all over the place. And the SLB changes that. This thing actually becomes compact. Tell us a little bit about that, that breakdown. Well, for me, I take it out the case. I put the shoulders on now. Before I finish, I want to play something so you can hear the difference between the mic sound and the DI sound, so, okay. so your listeners can hear that. Okay, here you see this. This is like this is like the shoulders of the acoustic bass. Mm-hmm. This is like the shoulders on the other side of the acoustic bass. So I know I, when I do this, this should be a C. That should be a C. So a C. Okay. This helps me gauge where the notes are. That's the same thing I've used for my acoustic bass. The other shoulder helped me gauge what notes I want to play. But sometimes when I'm playing with Billy Child, I'm playing and I have to play a C. See? Now, here's the difference in the, the SRT sound of the microphone. Then I'm going to play it with, with, with like the predecessor would sound like before this. So let me... Wow. And one thing I'll I'll say definitely, you don't have a deficit of resonance where because there's no sound cavity, there's no body there. I think that would be the first thing people would think, well, it can't resonate like there's room in there, but it it sounds like it. It sounds like you've got that whole body there. Yes. Now, also, I'm putting this right here. See how the back of it? Mm -hmm. Just unscrew this. I unscrew this, I fold it together, and just set it in the case, and I'm done. I put it over my shoulders, and I'm walking out the club, just like the horn players. There you go. <laughs> he, he, gets his, he, gets his, he gets his paycheck, and he's on the subway five minutes later. <laughs> That's right. And with the, the case, when it's all folded up, what are we looking at? About like four feet by? Well, we call it subway friendly. Mm-hmm. It slips into a case, which is basically the length of the body. The end pin comes out of it, the frame folds up, and it slips into a case that's a little bigger than a normal bass case, I would say, lengthwise, a bass guitar case. It's thicker and all, but it goes over your shoulder and weighs about 15, 16 pounds. Yes, to be, to be exact, 14.8 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> The thing is, if, if you're uh, internationally traveling, the case that comes with it is a soft case. It's a soft padded case to make it lighter. Mm-hmm. But if you need to travel, SKB makes a, a case for an 88 key synthesizer rig, and it fits right inside that case. And even the stand fits inside there, too. So and it's got wheels and you're you're ready to go. So Kenny needs to go to Europe. He's He's, he's got an easy solution. Yes. Got you. Now, when it is in the case, and I don't know if you've encountered this because we talk about travel, will will it fit in an overhead compartment? No, it won't. It'll have to go. It'll, gotcha. it'll, oh, nothing. Well, almost nothing fits in an overhead <laughs> cabin now anyway because everybody's <laughs> carrying on. <That's>, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, we've we've always heard all the the countless horror stories of people that had got all the way like to the final gate and been turned away and had to check their instruments to the baggage handlers and the when they've come out on the other end the damage that <laughs> they've seen. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, the the case the case that SKB makes is is uh, ATA rated, so it's made to be thrown off of a cart on the way to an airplane, for that. So I use several of them when I ship these to shows and everything, and they're so beaten up. But that's 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 what they're for. Absolutely, oh. it's also interesting that this is the 300, and so even in the evolution of the instrument, there's been I guess obviously what a 100 and a 200. So it's evolving as well. Always. And the thing with this, too, is that is that we were able to put it into the bass first because most of that is just uh, is just acoustical physics that the bass sound is. A, it, if you ever saw an, an acoustic bass played on an oscilloscope, it gives you this big, clean S sign. It just goes like that. And also it was a simple signal to reproduce nice. on it from here. We'll move it to other instruments. One of one of Yamaha's things is we call it vertical integration. Is that you know we'll start uh, and and it, and it always starts at the top. We never start at the bottom. Let's say well here's a here's a great student electric bass and we're going to make it better. It's like no, we make we make Kenny Davis happy first, yeah. and then that technology moves down. You'll see that in pianos. You'll see it in trumpets. You'll see it in motorcycles. That's like, you know, those those guys those guys driving Yamaha motorcycles over those over those hills and everything. Once they're happy, then we know that we're gonna make somebody else happy on the on the on the lower end of it. That that technology always moves down to the broadest section of uh, of consumers. Gotcha. Well, gotcha. and that is a it's a great philosophy because there's nothing more discouraging for someone who's learning an instrument to have something that doesn't perform for them that they're not getting out of it what they're what they're hoping again like my grandfather's fiddle uh that was not going to deliver probably what i needed from it whether i wanted to or not because it was already about 50 years old when i got my hands on it so it, it it's it's great that out of the box somebody can get a high quality sounding instrument with the travel characteristics it looks like it's got a versatility for all kinds of music oh yes Yes, matter of fact, I was on the phone with the with the legendary drummer Lenny White nice. earlier today, and I was telling him about this uh, silent bass. He said, "No," I said, "Yes, Lenny." <laughs> <South and Houston. laughs> no, <laughs> I said, "He said, Kenny, you're gonna have to bring it over or something like that. We got to see." It. So he got the website. He's, he he went on the website. He said, "Oh, that's like you know, all right." <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so when we play together, I'm pretty sure he's gonna ask me to bring the silent bass. <laughs> there you go. And, you know, those drummers, drums have are, are probably one of the most ancient instruments there are, and they really haven't changed all that much. I know the drummers are going to get all upset with me, you know, other than newer materials and stuff. But I, <laughs> I, had, I had the opportunity to see uh, in the Dominican Republic, they make, they hollow out tree trunks and stretch goat skin over them and play yeah. them for like, 48 hours at a time, you know, they actually strap them on their waists and they play and it's a, a, a whole party. It's, it's not too distant from the conga. I mean, <laughs> other than the tuners and, and the things, I mean, it, it's, it's hasn't come that far. Whereas obviously the SLB has really come a far way from that original upright, which you know, was the, the inspiration. So are there, are there any other technical things we should know about this instrument, Ken? If somebody's considering thinking, yeah, this looks like, you know, why, why, what other things would, they, would motivate them to go, let me get this instead of a traditional instrument? Well, I, I, always, I always tell players, this is, this is the base you want to have with you when you, you, you don't want to take your, your $12,000 car German 150-year-old base to play a fifty dollar gig in a park on a Sunday when it might rain on it. You don't have to worry about seams opening. You don't have to worry about cracking and repairing and that you it's so all of that all all of that maintenance issue is eliminated from it. So that's one of the curses of an old acoustic bass may sound awesome, but it's gonna cost you some money in its lifetime too. So 
Gotcha. But something's not going to go right with it, and the seam's going to pop open, and a, a, a rib will crack or something, and that's that's big, big, big dollars. Gotcha. Well, and I, it also makes me wonder, and again, maybe you can tell me, I don't, do these ever need any, like, do they run into issues where they, I'm sorry, everything may need repair at some point. And I know with traditional basses, bass players will tweak things and, and change things around because it's still very, you know, strings, wood, metal, it, it's very manual. When it comes to electronics, this is a very sophisticated thing. It's like I used to work on my car, but I won't work on my car now because it's got a computer. Oh, and... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can't. Yeah, <laughs> can't even change the oil. You can't find the oil filter anymore. Yeah, it, it, you, you open it up, you go, "Yep, there it is," and close it up, <laughs> <laughs> close it down again. But what what does one do? Does do they? Is, is there a, a network for of support? Because I don't know these do these go beyond the scope of a regular luthier? Actually, not not too much. Uh, I think it, it, you know the the fingerboard maintenance and bridge. I think Kenny, you had your you had you had your bridge tweaked a little bit, and that's yeah. a, when when we when we send them out, we tend to leave things a little high. Like a bridge will be a little bit higher than you would want it, even though that 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 bridge is is it has adjustable tuners on it it's got wheels so that you can adjust the height yourself but we leave it a little thicker and a little higher because of the principle that it's easier to take wood off than it is to put it on but if something were to go wrong with the bridge it's a base bridge it's a standard base bridge okay. otherwise you can just take it to your your luthier down the road at some point your fingerboards will need some redressing they'll need to be replaned and stuff that's that's again that's a normal thing for a luthier there's there's no surprises to a trained luthier when they have to do something with it as far as electronics go the instruments all all yamaha strings have a five-year warranty okay. on it and in an electric every electrical electrical problems will happen it's like anybody who sells anything that's electronic will tell you if it's a well-made product the failure rate will be less than five percent sure on it so with the five-year warranty if something's going to go wrong with it electronically it's probably going to happen inside of those five years those five years from there other than that a pickup may you know just just wear out over time and that's every guitar that you know those pickups are that's the moving part yeah. In the in the equation, and it will give up the ghost at some point, but that's an easy repair too. It's just a uh, it it you just take the pickup out of it, and there's no soldering or anything. It, it's all plugs on the inside. So you 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 unplug the pickup, put the new one in, plug it in, put it back together. And it's so pretty pretty simple as 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 far as that goes. Very cool. Well, and this so much fascinating stuff about this as we are talking in the pandemic i i will just kind of bring up kenny imagine that you like many musicians are kind of on pause as so many are but yeah. as things move forward and you were really busy before all this happened and i'm sure you'll be really busy when things kind of get back to normal if people want to stay on top of what you're doing they should go to www.kennydavis.net if i'm not mistaken yes that's right. That's correct. Excellent. And Ken, for more information on the SLB 300, the best place to go is yamahastrings.com? That's correct. Perfect. Is there any any last thoughts? Oh, I know. I did want to forget. The kind of strings you have on your bass are Dia Dari, if I'm not mistaken as well. Kenny, right? Yes, on my on my on my on my uh, upright bass, the Adario, and also for the silent bass, the Adario. Well, I, I use the uh, hybrids, Hollycore hybrids. Good, because I'm sure people will want to know if they want to duplicate what they've been hearing today. They're going to yeah. go, okay, how am I going to, you know, get all all these bits together? Well, gentlemen, we appreciate you taking time to share with me. We've had folks, Kenny Davis, Ken Detmore. Coming to you live on Bass Musician Magazine, talking a whole bunch about the Yamaha SLB 300. That's the bass to get. There you go. <laughs> That's the bass to get. Yes. <laughs>